Two balls and a strike to count on Taylor. Reyes fires. Swing and a drive. Deep left field. This is one back. Walk him out. Let's tell What's up, everybody? Welcome into Dodger Heads, presented by DodgerBlue.com. My name is Jeff Spiegel, joined today by Matt Moreno. Matt, we are talking Dodgers-Braves. That series has wrapped up. As Before we look ahead to Padres-Dodgers, which we will in just a moment, kind of a fun one to look back on. Dodgers take two out of three from the Braves. They win 7-4, to four, lose 3-1, to one, win 5-1. to one. They move to 9-3 and three on the season. That's the best record in baseball, although three teams in the NL West just one game back. So we're going to get to some big takeaways sort of individually, but on a big-picture scale, Dodgers take two out of three from the Braves. Is this a big deal or no deal to you? I think it's a big deal. Obviously, you know, they went into the series on a six-game winning streak, but, you know, some people were questioning it, saying, hey, it was only against the yeah. Twins, it was only against the Reds, which – you know, you and I sort of push back on in the sense that a four-game series sweep is difficult against anybody. Mm -hmm. So I think it was nice to see. You know, I know the Braves are struggling a little bit, but still a quality team with a you know a good lineup. So it was good to see the Dodgers take two of three, obviously, and you know their pitching still stood out, which has been a, a significant storyline to begin the year. Absolutely, absolutely. And of course, you know, we'll get into a little bit. There was some extra emotion here with the Freddie Freeman stuff, the Kenley Jansen stuff, et cetera. But the way I wanted to frame this is let's just talk about our biggest takeaways from the series. Um, you've got three, I've got two. So I'll start with you. Your biggest takeaway um, from this series, from the three games that we just saw is what? Well, I guess my biggest one, honestly, is probably Cody Bellinger. Uh, he's... I think we, like I, like I said on some of our other videos, we'd seen his swing, you know, sort of improving. There was a little bit of regression where the strikeouts were coming back, but I think him, you know, either way, uh, hit a home run, obviously, put together more uh, multi-hit games. Uh, so it's just encouraging to kind of see him continuing to, you know, sort of swing the bat well. And he got off to a pretty bad start this season, so yeah. his overall stat quite there yet because he has some, uh, definitely has some ground to make up. But he's, def he's certainly trending in the right direction. I think that's important. Yeah, I mean, and people have given me a hard time because I've been hard on Cody Bellinger. I have predicted that, that maybe this season wouldn't be, you know, a return to all-star form. Um, but I have to admit, I mean, things have been encouraging. I know early on I was still sort of, like, hesitant because I was looking at the stat cast numbers and saying – Man, like I, I know he's got some ground balls that are squeaking through holes and the batting average is looking a little better than it should. But I'll say this, his stat cast numbers are all going up. I think last time we had talked, he had something like one barrel in the entire season. He's now in the 68th percentile for barrels, 70th percentile for hard hit. Uh, he's over 50th percentile in exit velocity, expected batting average, walk rate, um, expected slugging percentage, all those things. And, and look, the thing with Bellinger is, average on the offensive side like is a massive upgrade over last year you know nobody two years ago would have been like yeah we're just shooting for average with Cody Bellinger but the numbers are trending in the direction of positive and again if he hits 250 and the way to runs created plus is average to slightly above average with the elite defense that he gives you he's an incredibly valuable player I don't know if he's going to be worth the big contract that somebody hands him this offseason but I'm with you I think that's the encouraging numbers of Bellinger are starting to be backed up by the underlying metrics of StatCast type stuff. So I'm with you on Bellinger. I like that one um, for a big takeaway. Um, my first one is is kind of another guy that maybe, I don't want to say has struggled, but, but maybe hadn't won over too many people, and that's Tony Gonsolin. This is a guy that if you watch the show, I've long been a fan of. I've looked at the ERA, and the ERA is great, and people would say, look at the whip. The whip is terrible. Yes, I get that. This season was kind of a similar thing. I think we had a commenter, Laura, say it's like he puts all the traffic but gets everybody out. You know, there's tons of traffic but no runs scored. Um, well, on Wednesday, he has probably one of the better games of his career. Six innings pitch, just one hit, three walks, three strikeouts, 83 pitches. So that was a big thing for him to get through six innings, to get to 83 pitches. His ERA is .69 through three starts on this season. Um, the Dodgers with Andrew Heaney going to the injured list are going to need a guy like Gonsolin to step up and provide some consistency now that Tyler Anderson cannot be his backup. And so this was just really encouraging from Gonsolin. The stuff has looked good this year. For him to put it together against a team like the Braves was huge. Definitely. I think it honestly was a reminder of what his really is. I don't yeah. think there's really been any question about that. Certainly not for me. I know not for you, obviously. Uh, my biggest thing was just that, like, is he going to put it together? Mm -hmm. When is he going to sort of put it together? And I think we did see that, and I agree with you. You know, even before the Heaney injury, Gunn's importance to the team in the rotation was already pretty high just because of the current state. Uh, so now with Heaney going down, it's definitely even more so. Yeah. So it was certainly uh, encouraging to see him, you know, 
put together that kind of outing and hopefully now he can build on it moving forward. Yeah, absolutely. All right. Number two, biggest observation, biggest takeaway from you is what? Yeah, I think, I mean, obviously it has to be Freddie Freeman, right? So, you know, we knew going in the Braves were coming and I felt bad for him because on Sunday he, he spoke with us about it because obviously that series, the red series has ended and now you're the Braves. Then Monday, once the Braves media were in town, then he had to have another big uh, media session in the dugout. Then, of course, he goes and hits his first yeah. home run of the season. So he had to talk about uh, the Braves and just his home run again after the game. And then he hit a home run Wednesday. So he had to be Wednesday and that talking. And the biggest thing I think that he wanted to just really emphasize was that it was good to see all of his former teammates more so than like actually playing them because he kept going back to, you know, we obviously won a World Series together and we're friends. And yeah, I was in that organization for a long time. I have a lot of long standing relationships, which is certainly understandable. Uh, so I think it was good for him to sort of, you know, kind of see everybody again. And as he uh, mentioned, because of the lockout and just moving to California during the offseason, he didn't see he hadn't seen them since their parade. Yeah. So to get that out of the way and, of course, you know, to then take two out of three and hit a couple home runs didn't hurt. Yeah, it's weird when you, you, you rarely think about here's a guy who spends just about every day for nine months with the same guys for the last, you know, however many years that group has been together. And then all of a sudden he signs a new deal. It's not like he's in the same place as those people. People are all over the place. Nobody's in the clubhouse together. And so you don't really get a chance to say goodbye in person. So I would imagine that there was part of him that this series was kind of hanging over his head as the season began. Like he knew this moment was coming. You could tell in some of the interviews he gave how emotional it was. But you said it. Four for 11, two home runs, three runs, three RBIs, two walks. Uh, of course, his first home run as a Dodger comes against the Braves in his first at bat against the Braves. Just a very poetic moment. I'm sure that meant a lot to him. You could tell the dugout, those guys were pretty excited about that. And so uh, I'm with you, Freeman. If if that would have been in my top three, um, so I'm glad we'll share that in this, in this top five here. Um, the next one for me is the bullpen. I know the starting pitching has gotten a lot of credit as far as how good it has been. When you look at this series in particular, Gonsolin was great. Kershaw was fine. You know, Bueller was fine. Like, neither of those guys was amazing. It was really the bullpen that was fantastic. I looked at their numbers. They go 11 innings pitch. They allow just one run. That one run was a meaningless ninth inning run allowed by Mitch White in game three of the series. So to start the series, it was 10 scoreless innings. They had more strikeouts than hits allowed. And if you want to look for kind of a key to this bullpen, this is the number that I was looking at. Their ability to pound the strike zone. The bullpen in this series across three games threw 153 pitches. 74% went for strikes. I mean, these are guys, no matter who it is, Bickford, Vessia, Hudson, Gratterall, they are just pounding the strike zone. Everything is in and around the strike zone, not giving away any free bases. I think that's the key for a bullpen. And so as much credit as the starting pitching has gotten so far, as much attention has been paid to one of the better lineups that we may see in our lifetime, the bullpen has been absolutely lights out, especially in this series. Yeah, I think they're flying under the radar a little bit. I know we talked about them in our last video, and in some sense it is a little bit of uh, what was to be expected because going into the season, we you know you looked at the relievers who were on the active roster and you expected it to be a pretty stout bullpen, and it's credit to them. They're certainly living up to uh, those expectations. And it's also even more impressive what they did against the Braves considering Blake Trinan wasn't available yeah. because of some uh, shoulder soreness. Uh, fortunately, it doesn't look to be too, too serious. It should be back for uh, this weekend against the Padres but you know even you know somebody like David Price who has been a little inconsistent in his time with the Dodgers he was part of that as well he did get some help from Mookie Betts making a nice sliding catch uh, but he pitched through some traffic you know, that one or two strikeouts to sort of put himself yeah. in that position for Mookie to make a play for him uh, but definitely you know credit to all those guys okay last one last one your fifth uh, takeaway your third our fifth takeaway from the Braves Dodgers series was what yeah so it's Kenley Jansen the entire situation requires a ton of a nuance and context. And I think, you know, first, as much as it was uh, strange for Freddie Freeman to have to play against the Braves, you had the same thing with yeah. Kenley Jansen, you know, coming back for the first time to face the Dodgers. And he said he got lost going to the clubhouse. He had to ask, uh, you know, a staff member how to get there. And it was weird. You know, we were asked if it's more weird to see Freddie Freeman in a Dodgers uniform or Kenley Jansen in a Braves uniform. And I think for me, it's easily Kenley. And it, a lot of it could just be that's who we yeah. have covered on a day to day basis for years. Whereas with Freeman, like, yes, you knew he was playing for the Braves, but you're not actually seeing him in a Braves uniform all yeah. the time. Uh, so that was strange. And, you know, it was nice to, to see Kenley get a warm reception the first game of the series. And the Dodgers played a video for him. Dave Roberts, Andrew Friedman, Justin Turner then presented him with a framed picture of, I'm pretty sure it was his first save with the team. 
Uh, and then, of course, the next night he enters the game with a lead and a chance for a save. And this is where I saw like a lot of discourse. You know, some fans booed him coming in. I don't necessarily think it's that big of a deal. Yeah. So long, with the caveat that so long as it's coming from the standpoint of he's an opposing pitcher, yep. Dodger fans boo every opposing relief pitcher that comes into a game all the time. If anybody booed because he chose the Braves, that like that's not right. Yeah. But and obviously there's no way to really go around <laughs> each fan and say, hey, why were you booing? Why were you booing? But I just think to blanket to make a blanket statement that he shouldn't have been booed at all is wrong because at the end of the day, like it is a game, and if you're a Dodger fan coming in to try to uh, finish a game against the team that you're rooting for, yeah, yeah, and a game by the way that sucked for the Dodger fans because the Dodgers were like no hit through six innings and like the offense did nothing, they lose three to one. So I have no problem. To me, the biggest indicator was going to be that tribute video because it, it's yeah. completely detached from the actual outcome of the game and how things are going. That is, It is strictly based on what do I think about Kenley Jansen as a person, and there were no boos. By all accounts, it was like yeah, warm. You were, you were at the stadium for that one, right? Yeah, he got yeah he got a standing ovation for that. No, literally not one boo during that. And yeah. that had people booed during that, that would have been completely unfair and inappropriate. Yeah, so for me, it's like you're losing 3-1. to one. The, the closer comes in for the other team. Of course you boo. And by the way, it sucks because we didn't even get the Kenley Jansen experience. He looked dominant. It's like, come on, where's the walk a guy, put a guy on second base, tying run, tying run in scoring position kind of a thing. We don't even get that. But um, I, I'm with you. I mean, good for Kenley a, as a person to be able to come back to pitch well. Um, I'm sure that felt good for him in much the same way that Freddie Freeman hitting a home run off of the Braves felt good for him. And so, um, yeah, well, let's shift here because what's fascinating is the Dodgers now move from this Brave series to a series against the Padres, which if you think back 12 months ago, the Dodgers Padres early in the year was the absolute biggest series that, that for the Dodgers, for the Padres, but you could argue for all of major league baseball, it was two teams. Everybody was talking about, it was high energy. It was intense. There was some bad blood between the teams carrying over from the previous postseason, etc. You and I have talked, and I, I'm pretty confident that you think the Brave series was a much bigger deal, to you at least, than this Padres series would be. It, are, do you still feel that, having finished the Padres, or excuse me, the Brave series, looking ahead to the Padres, which of those series matters more to you? I think the Braves one did, just because there was, like we said, you know, we just covered the like emotional aspect for Freddie Freeman and yeah. Kenley Jansen. But, I mean, if you want from a baseball standpoint it has to be the Padres series because they are in the NL West and the NL West already like it's early yeah. obviously but the Rockies aren't playing well like the NL West is shaping up to be a tough division again yeah. uh but I agree with you You know it is interesting to kind of see one year later sort of how Dodgers matchup is being viewed now like last year it was on I think ESPN like yeah. early and often and you know it was being promoted by MLB across the board maybe some of it is the year that the Padres had people are a little uncertain of what yeah. kind of season they'll have now Maybe some of it is, you know, I know I'm really big on promoting Fernando Tatis. He's obviously not playing yet. Uh, but it's interesting to see, you know, how much more calm that this week, this weekend matchup totally. is compared to last year. Totally. So it's in San Diego. Here are the probables. Urias takes the mound versus Nick Martinez on Friday. Uh, Tyler Anderson gets his first start as a Dodger against Hugh Darvish on Saturday. And then Sunday is kind of the uh, the climax of the whole thing. Clayton Kershaw versus Sean Manea, two of the better pitchers in baseball this season so far in a very short season as well. Uh, you mentioned no Fernando Tatis. That's a big deal. But I, I said it at the open. The Dodgers have the best record in baseball. There is a three-way tie for the second place in the NL West, all one game back. The, the Rockies, Padres, and Giants are all one game back. Different combinations of wins and losses, but they're all one game back in that column. So uh, what are you looking for this series, if you want to make a prediction or, or something that you think you're going to see out of this three-game set quickly as we as we close this one out? Yeah, so I think the Dodgers will take two of three again. Uh, what will be interesting, I think, for me to see for not only this weekend, but just moving forward, is how Julio sort of yep. you know continues to bounce back and what he can put together. Frankly, time. Anderson you know we saw him he certainly pitched well in his two piggyback appearances after Tony Gonsolin but now with Heaney down as much as there isn't uh Dave Roberts or there isn't so much uh, long-term concern with his shoulder issue you don't necessarily know all the time the shoulder can be a and so Tyler Anderson could end up being a very important piece in the rotation moving forward so Saturday is sort of the first step towards that 
Yeah, it, it's interesting in that only Sunday is when you kind of get an even matchup as far as pitching. I'm with you, Julio, and Friday's a big one for me. We know he struggled with velocity and that kind of thing in the first start. I wouldn't necessarily say the velocity problems were all solved in his last start, but at least the results came. He pitched better, which to him was the key. What do we get out of Tyler Anderson? You touched on that's a big one. And then Kershaw versus Manea. I mean, Sunday afternoon, that's just going to be a great matchup. So uh, Matt and I will be here Friday night live post game for that first one. So as we talk about Julio is the thing to watch, Matt and I will be breaking it down. So join us whenever that one ends on Friday night. We'll be going live on the YouTube channel, Dodger Blue 1958. So make sure you subscribe there as well. So we look forward to that one. We'll have tons of coverage in the coming days of that Padres series. So we appreciate you joining us as we look back on the Brave series as well. That's Matt. My name's Jeff. As always, check out DodgerBlue.com for the latest Dodger Blue 1958 on social media. And please, if you're a podcast person, find us on Apple Podcasts. Even if you're not a podcast person, find us on Apple Podcasts. Click subscribe, rate, and review. That's super helpful to us, Spotify, Google, wherever you find it. We appreciate you. We'll see you next time. Dodgers Padres this weekend.